بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا فما بعد my dear brothers and sisters we are on the lessons from the, the class on the lessons from the life of Sayyidina Uthman, uh, Uthman uh, Sayyidina Luqman عليه السلام and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to take and learn the lessons for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed his kalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned these people, his Anbiya Ali Musa, um, in the Quran so that we learn lessons from them about how to live our life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned others in the Quran. He mentioned Firaun and Shaddad and Haman and Qarun. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the great uh, so-called kings <coughs> and the great so-called conquerors and so on and so forth of, uh, um, of, the, of history so that we learn lessons about what not to do. Right? So we have to learn both kinds of lessons. Lessons about what to do and lessons about what not to do. Now, I want to ask you a question, I want you to think about this, which is that think about how we teach history. For example, we, we have, uh, we call Alexander, Alexander the Great, right? And of course, uh, we Muslims being the world's greatest uh, imitators, we simply imitate what people say. So everybody else says Alexander the Great, so we say Alexander the Great. We don't ask this question and say, what was great about Alexander? Why must I refer to him as Alexander the Great? In Urdu we say, Sikandar e Azam. So, Azam kaise ban gaya? Or kis vajes se Azam hai? Naud billah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Azam hai. Alexander Azam nahi hai. But the point being that this is how we seem to uh, we seem to le lead our life uh, by just imitating people and that's why I, I, I remember, I mean, I uh, remind you and myself, uh, let us not do that, let us uh, live our lives uh, in a way where we are, um, we, we use our intelligence, inshallah, and uh, we lead our lives in a way which is beneficial for us and it is beneficial for uh, those who are in uh, in our circle of influence, so our families, friends, and so on and so forth. So, why did what makes Alexander the, uh, Alexander great? Now if you if you take the the people um, in the world, <clears throat> they are overawed by violence. They're overawed by this super aggressive. Uh, macho, male, uh, masculine, uh, you know, uh, model, right? Uh, and we call them the great. Uh, take Caesar, the word Caesar, which comes from Julius Caesar's personal name. And then Augustus, who was the first uh, Roman emperor. Um, Julius Caesar uh, started, and that's why he was killed because they wanted to preserve the <clears throat> the democratic nature of the Roman uh, it wasn't an empire at the time but uh, whatever it was it was the beginnings of an empire um, so because Caesar had already conquered Gaul and he had conquered uh, remember what this, the Romans were Italians so you have this bunch of Italians who came out of Italy and then they conquered uh, you know a whole lot of countries of Europe uh, he conquered uh, Caesar conquered uh, Gaul, he conquered Germania, uh, he conquered, uh, he went into uh, Britannia, uh, into the British Isles, he didn't actually conquer that, he came back out of there, back to Rome. Now the point is that here is this man, one single person, Caesar, Caesar was killed because of all this, he tried to become emperor, they didn't like it, and they finally managed to kill him, and Augustus then took up the baton, uh, in the name of Caesar, uh, in the name of avenging Caesar, and then he made himself the dictator and the 
uh, the, he, made, he was the first Roman emperor and that kingdom <coughs> of Rome uh, lasted all the way until Muhammad al-Fatih, the uh, Ottoman uh, Sultan conquered Constantinople uh, and made it Istanbul. Uh, and the king of Constantinople at that time was Constantine the 11th. So this is um, Constantine the first built the city, and Constantine and that and Constantine the first built the city in uh, the fifth century, which is uh, which is 200 years uh, before Rasulullah was born, and. Um, then Constantine the eleventh was the last of the uh, of the of the great Roman rulers. And by the time it came to Constantine, it wasn't very great. But he was the last Kaiser of Rome. He was the last Caesar of Rome. Although he was not in Rome, he was in <clears throat> he was now in almost in Asia. But um, he was the last Caesar of Rome. Now think about this. Guess what title? Muhammad Al Fatih, the first Sultan of uh, not the first sultan of the Ottomans, but the first sultan who conquered uh, Constantinople. When he conquered Constantinople and he entered Constantinople as a conqueror, uh, guess what is the title that he gave himself? The title that he gave himself was Caesar of Rome. Now, here was a Turk. Uh, he was a Turk. Um, there was no... Uh, concept of Turkey as a nation state. There were no nation states at the time. Uh, there were no nation states. Rome was the name of an empire. Uh, it was not a nation state. Uh, but think about this. The point I'm making is that these names that we uh, of history are so powerful that even when the the person legitimately bearing that name and that title because he is from from that family, he is from uh, not family, but he's from from that li from that uh, uh, dynasty, from that line, uh, which was Constantine the Eleventh. He was the Caesar of Rome. When he's defeated, when he and he died in battle, he died fighting. Uh, they never found his body, and uh, uh, Muhammad Al Fatih took over uh, as the uh, as the conqueror and ruler of Constantinople, and therefore of the uh, of whatever the rem last remnant of the Byzantine or Roman Empire, uh, he doesn't call himself uh, Osmani Sultan or Ottoman Sultan, uh, he, which he is, <clears throat> and he was to his subjects, to the people who, who, uh, who, who were under his rule, uh, but he called himself Caesar of Rome. Now, this macho model, if you take Julius Caesar, if you take Augustus, if you take all of those people, if you take uh, Alexander the Great, what is great about them? Right? We extol murder, we extol mass murder, we extol looting, we extol uh, invasion of other people's lands. Uh, think about the millions upon millions of people who have died by the sword of this conqueror or that conqueror. Think of the millions upon millions of people uh, especially the women and children who have died or who have been enslaved, who have been raped, who have been, who have been um, violated at the hands of the soldiers of this conqueror or that conqueror, only to extol and only to uh, glorify this image of aggressive male machoism. Now tell me, how much longer do we want to carry this on? 2,000 years is not enough. If I count from, uh, you know, Julius Caesar uh, down to our times, 2,000 years is not enough. 2,000 years of history has not taught us anything. And that's why they say that I think the, the most, uh, the two quotes about history, both, neither of them is mine, uh, which uh, I really like. One is, Nations which do not learn from their history are condemned to repeat it. Nations which do not learn from their history are condemned to repeat it, and this applies also to individuals. And the second one is that the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing. I think these are 
two of the uh, two of the best quotes that I have uh, that I have ever heard uh, concerning history and the reason why we really should learn history and why we we should take lessons from history. So this 2,000 years of history has not taught us that this model uh, of uh, kingship, the model of rulership, the model of success for the individual. Now you might say, well, you know, none of us listening to this are, uh, you know, are ever remotely going to become Caesars or uh, rulers of nations. Allah knows best because this thing goes all over the world. Uh, I don't know who's listening. Maybe some potential rulers of the world are also listening. I do hope you are listening because then it is your in your hand to change this model. But even if you are not a potential ruler of the world, it is in your hand, individuals, to change the model of your success because our success also is based on the same model. It's not based on the model of uh, a ruler and conqueror with an army. It is based on the same model of grab what you can get, irrespective of the cost to others as a result of your strategy of grab and take. Now that is a, that's a strategy. Firauniyat remains. Firaun has gone, but Firauniyat remains. The nature of Firaun remains. Caesar is dead and has been dead for two years, but the concept of Caesar, even if I convert that word into, uh, into, into the, you know, one of the English meanings of it, which is to seize, right? To Caesar, the one who seizes, <clears throat> not one who gives. Now contrast this with the model of success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in Islam, which deals with giving. What is the model of the Ambiyas, alayhi salam? Were they Caesars? Did they take things from people? Did they, did they uh, swallow people's property? Uh, did they kill people? Did they uh, take away their land? And did they take away their dignity? And they take away their lives? Did they do that? Or did they give you things? Did they give you moral codes of life which if you had followed, you would not be in the misery and mess that we are in today? Did they give you a sense of accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which tells us that you cannot get away with what you are doing no matter how powerful you think you are today, no matter how today's world ensures that you get away but you cannot get away because today's world is not in control. Today's world is subjected to the creator of the world. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu who is in control and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu is the one who will decide what happens to you and me when we meet him on the day of judgment. And that meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely and totally certain. There is no doubt about that. <clears throat> there is absolutely no doubt about that. There is no doubt about the fact that one day I will die. And there is no doubt about the fact that one day I will be resurrected before my Rabb Jalla Jalaluhu. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy and for his protection and for his forgiveness when I meet him Jalla Jalaluhu. My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> this is what we need to learn. We need, and that is the reason why we have uh, these four uh, lessons, Monday through Thursday, Monday uh, through Thursday, four lessons on, we have the four tops, which is Akhlaq of the Ummati, Living Islam, Le and right now we are doing lessons from the lives of the Anbiya, and we are doing the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and this one, which is the wisdom of the lessons we are doing, and every week, so every day, there is a lesson alhamdulillah do tune in same channel same everything else do tune in do um, do come online and, and watch this live inshallah and if you are not able to do that of course see it later but the point is that um, do take some time out and reflect on your own life I reflect on my life and I'm requesting you to requesting you to reflect on your life because a time will come when this life will go. Just yesterday I heard about the 
passing away of another very dear friend of mine, uh, Farooq Qadr Saab, uh, who was a very good friend. He was one of our regular musallis in, uh, in our masjid in Hyderabad, uh, MHMIC, and a uh, very, very uh, wonderful person. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him Jannat al Firdausul Allah bi ghairi hisab. Please make dua for him. I request you to make dua for him. How many people, I mean, I have uh, quite literally, you know, I, uh, from the time I came here to America, and this is now, I think, um, the seventh or eighth month that I've been here, um, I think about almost uh, 12 uh, or 14 of my people I knew personally, very good friends. Some of them friends for over 50 years. Some of them, two of them mentors of mine, right? Uh, very dear friends. They all died. And they didn't all die together. I mean, in this, in this time, uh, you know, over the period of this, of this month, but I, this is the, 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 uh, the reports of their death that I got. And they did not die from COVID. They died from other, they died from other natural causes. Uh, think about this and say that how many reminders do I need? How many reminders do you need? That one day, it is going to be somebody else who is going to be talking about my death. And somebody is going to say, uh, Yavar Beg died, please make dua for him and ask Allah to forgive him. Inshallah, I hope somebody will do that. But saying that this is going to happen, this is, there's, there's no doubt about this fact. And Allah is sending us reminder after reminder. Despite that, if we are not going to wake up and if we are not going to understand and realize and accept that, I will be held accountable, then what do we have to do and, how, and, and who do we have to blame? Let us think about this. Let us learn from history. And by the way, history is not only for nations. History is for individuals. It is, and it's not necessary. Don't think about, oh, but you know, my history is not recorded and I'm not a king and so on and so forth. So nobody wrote, wrote the, you know, the, 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 the line, my lineage and my family tree and so on. I don't know. It doesn't matter. We just look at our own lives. Look at your own life and reflect on your life and sit down and say from my earliest childhood memory, what do I see myself doing? <clears throat> Look at those incidents. There's a whole thing called fractal theory, uh, which uh, sometime we will do that, but uh, you don't have to go into the theory. Just sit down on a piece, piece of paper, sit and write and say my earliest childhood memories, what do I see myself doing? What was I doing when I was a little, little child? And then say, when I say, what is your earliest memory? Maybe when you were two years old or three years old, depending on how far back your memory is and how good your memory is and how old you are. Now go back and say, well, you know, when I was two or three years old, what was I doing? Then when I was, say, five years old, what was I doing? When I was seven years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, and so on and so forth, until you come to your current age and you, you, you write down uh, those uh, incidents or you, you know, make little, uh, <clears throat> little drawings or something to remind you of those incidents and then you look at that whole chart and you say what does it teach me this chart of mine what is it teaching me what is the lesson that i'm getting about myself look at it from an individual incident perspective and look at it also overall as the as what is the pattern that this is showing me is this a winning pattern or is this a losing pattern am i looking at somebody who didn't just take advantage of opportunities, but a person who created those opportunities, who went behind them, who created them. There was no opportunity until this man or this woman got behind it, and then they actually created, or created an opportunity in a situation where others would have been sitting and lamenting a loss. Right? Is that what you are seeing? Or are you seeing the opposite of that, which is somebody who is given life on a platter, who is given life, uh, you know, everything uh, ready-made and everything mm, clear, and yet uh, that person, instead of m taking advantage of that, instead of uh, making use of that, is losing that opportunity. Um, my brothers and sisters, really uh, think about uh, this and say what is my 
in my own life. Hmm? What is my role in life? What is it that I uh, need to be able to 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 accomplish I mean, what did I come into this world to do uh, think about that and just ask yourself question what did I come into this world to do to accomplish now we are looking at the uh, life of uh, at, at the lessons from Luqman alayhi salam and as I mentioned to you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began with the with the uh, taqid and with the advice uh, and with the admonition about being grateful to him Jalla Jalla. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began with it. Anish He said, oh, be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then he said, the one who is grateful is grateful for himself. And let us uh, therefore be people who are grateful. Uh, we looked at this whole issue of gratitude in uh, great detail. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a means of uh, blessing and, uh, and reflection. This is one of the things about being uh, in these places that people are so polite and so uh, so nice. You know, everybody waves to you and everybody is, is sort of greets you. Yeah. May Allah make, make us among people who are uh, also polite like this. Now, how can we become grateful? Let us think about that. We're talking about the importance of gratitude and I'm sure that uh, that is clear, inshallah. So now that we accept that we should be grateful, uh, how can we be grateful? So let us uh, think about that. Now you can be grateful by reflecting on the blessing and on what life would have been without it. Now, um, and that's pretty easy to do if you take a few minutes each day, uh, just reflect on what would it be like to be blind. Now, what I suggest you do, and do this as an exercise, make this into a learning exercise for your family. Right? Have some fun as well, but do it as a, uh, you know, if I can use the term or coin the term, serious fun, which is that you have fun doing it, but it's not just a time activity, you are not whiling away time. You're using that thing uh, positively uh, to get some real life mileage out of it. Now, how can you... Uh, the, uh, how can you reflect on what does it feel like to be blind? Now, you might say, well, you know, why should I uh, reflect on that? Because this is a, a, a tragic reality of the human condition that we, are, we become aware of a blessing only after it is gone. We have the blessing, we are enjoying it, but we are not grateful for it. Uh, may Allah protect us from ourselves. Uh, we do not give thanks for this blessing while we still have it. Although we have it and we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we are not. We have become conscious of it only after it is gone. So, alhamdulillah, let us not wait uh, for that. Let us simulate the uh, thing of the blessing having gone and then say, if I didn't have this thing, what would it feel like? And so therefore now when I have this blessing, what must I do? So what would it feel like to be blind? Very simple. What you do is find someone to be your pa your partner and physically do this exercise. Please, I mean, I, do, I don't want you to just sit and imagine that. Physically do this exercise. Take a blindfold. You put on the blindfold and do it well. Don't, don't cheat because you're, you will be cheating yourself. So put this blindfold, you know, across your eyes in, in a way that you're completely blinded. And then let your partner lead you on a tour. So wherever you are, whether you are inside your apartment, you can't leave the place, or whether you are in the parking lot, or whether you are in a garden, or whether wherever you are, let your partner lead you by the hand. And then the job of the partner is to explain to you what he or she is seeing. So do this as an exercise. The job of the partner is So it, it, this is an exercise which, which uh, helps and serves both people. So the job of the partner, therefore, is to become your eyes. So let the partner tell you what he or she is seeing. You will be surprised. Believe me, it will blow your mind. I do this exercise as a, as a leadership exercise for team building. And it's a very, very powerful exercise. 
is to lead somebody, is to lead a, a within quotes, blind person. Now, when you are listening to this person speaking, try to visualize what they are saying. Try to visualize what they are saying. Also, try to use your other senses. Your hearing, your, your, your sense of smell, sense of feeling. Try to use those senses as well. Do this exercise as far as being, being blind is concerned. Similarly, you can do for everything else. Uh, being mute, for example, you can't speak. So then write. I want to communicate something to somebody. How can I do that? And this is incidentally, those of you who are interested in writing, people ask me, how can I be an author? You've written so many books. You can be an author by writing. There's no other way of being an author. How can I learn to ride a bicycle? By riding a bicycle. So similarly, how can you be an author? By writing. And how can you write? By putting in words what you are seeing. By holding your thing to say, I will not speak, I'm going to write. So, write. Um, being, so this is, you know, you, you're practicing being, being, You know, I know any of you, I'm probably, you played this this game, Dumb Sharad, where you, you just use sign language, and I'm not saying sign language as in the sign language that uh, is, is the is the way of communicating for people who are unable to speak, yeah, because that's, that, that's very uh, advanced and sophisticated, and you can actually communicate words and so on. I'm saying sign language that uh, people who are dumb without being dumb have to use. Um, so you get a sense of that, right? And similarly, uh, take for example, what does it feel like to be lame if you didn't have one leg? Believe me, I spent one year like that. I uh, I had a motorcycle accident and I had a thigh to ankle plaster for um, two months and after they took the plaster off, my leg, all the muscle had gone completely. had. Uh, deteriorated, had completely finished, and my leg was a stick. It was like a bone with skin on it, and that skin was black. And it was the color, of, and it was the, it had the texture of, a, of a, the skin of a fish. It had scales because of dryness. I mean, this was uh, in the 80s, and I don't know either they didn't have the technology at the time or what, but it was a horrible thing. So my leg had absolutely zero strength in it. It was as if my leg had been amputated. I really seriously believed that I was going to be um, to be handicapped, uh, you know, for, for the rest of my life. And I spent one year on crutches. I became quite a, quite expert at going up and down stairs uh, with my with my crutches. So one year I spent with crutches. So I know what is it, what it feels like not to have a leg. Alhamdulillah, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite glory and mercy gave my leg back to me. I did, in that whole one year, I did, uh, did physiotherapy very regularly, uh, you know, day after day, hour after hour. And Alhamdulillah, all the muscle came back and everything else and today I'm fine, absolutely. But the point I'm making is that practice this. What does it feel like to not have a blessing? In more you can see this. And you have different shapes and kinds and shapes. In some cases, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen, and may Allah protect us from ourselves, how many of you have seen people picking food out of garbage bins? How many people have seen that? people picking food out food out of garbage bins. And for those of you who are living in America and so on, you might say, oh, you know, but I'm in a, I live in a rich country. Well, you know, where I, fought, where I first saw people picking food out of garbage bins was in Mayfair in New York. There are poor people, believe me, there are poor people in the richest countries. I have seen people picking food out of garbage bins in Saudi Arabia. I saw an old uh, Afghan, maybe she was Somali or something. 
was picking food out of a garbage bin in Saudi Arabia in Jeddah. So just because you are living in a rich country and just because Allah gave you some money, don't think that everybody is like you. They're not. So what must you do now? I'm not saying you should go and pick that food out of the garbage bin and eat it and see what it feels like. Really, you should do that. But I'm not saying you should do that. So don't do it. But you can look for that. Look for homeless people. I was so shocked. I'm still shocked. In Seattle, when I first went to Seattle, I saw these people, these homeless people. Seattle is a wet city. In any case, this is, uh, you know, a cold part of the world. And this, has, this was in December, so it was cold. It was very cold. And despite that, homeless people, all wrapped up and bundled in all kinds of whatever clothes they can find, with whatever meager possessions they have in a, in a shopping cart, sitting and sleeping, sitting because there's no place to lie down, sitting in doorways. In, uh, in you know in the little alcoves as you enter a shop the little thing uh, sitting and sitting and sleeping there in the summer they sleep they sleep in parks and so on and so forth of course there's a whole theory about how and many people tell me oh you know but homeless people they really don't want a home if you give them a house they will leave it and they will go away and so on and so forth uh, people say the same thing about the Aboriginal people in the, in Australia Wallah Alam I don't know but I'm saying without even going into all that ask yourself. How would you like to be homeless? How would you like to be homeless? Believe me, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that, it doesn't take time. It does not take time. This COVID-induced uh, economic slump created people who were giving zakat, sadaqat into people who started receiving zakat from other people. Right? They didn't expect, not in their wildest dream did they expect that they would see a time when they would be eligible to receive zakat and they would, they would, no matter how much they hated that, they would have to receive zakat and they would have to live on the sadaqa of somebody else. When they had the money and so on and so forth, maybe they even said, oh, I will never do that. And you know, I would rather die than live on sadaqa. All of these things are easy to see. You realize what you are saying and, you know, whether that is uh, something which is uh, actually which, which will happen and which is feasible or not. So, take your children. Take your children and show them these signs and sights of poverty, abject poverty. Homeless people, people who are uh, who are scrounging around in uh, garbage bins for food. And I'm not going to tell you what I think you should then do thereafter. I mean, I, if that is not clear to you, then may Allah protect you from yourself. But the point I'm making is that seriously, do this as an exercise. Do this as an exercise. Look at what Allah has given you from the eyes of somebody who does not have it. And from your own eyes, put yourself in a situation where you are deprived of that. And then you see what life looks like. You know, we used to do this uh, uh, when I used to teach. Uh, yes, yeah, I still do, but not that particular in that particular area. Um, when I teach leadership, and we teach what, we, what is called outdoor leadership. And we use uh, the outdoors to create... Uh, to simulate leadership challenge situations and uh, to be teach people. So what we used to do was we would start in, in Bombay, in those days it used to be called Bombay, Mumbai. Um, and uh, the task was to get from Mumbai to Pune. Right? So we used to call Pune, Pune was Pune. So Bombay to Pune, so Mumbai to Pune. And we didn't have the, the, the big highway and so on, none, none of that was there. So what we would do, and we are now t looking at uh, corporate executives, because this is from my uh, consulting uh, um, corporations. So we, we did this with the, one of the corporations we did that was with the RPG group. So the, the thing, what we would do is we start with uh, a group of, uh, of the, the students who are corporate executives, many of them 
quite senior. So you had these people who were, you know, general managers. Uh, in in a couple of cases, we even had vice presidents because they said, "We, I want to be part of my team." So oh, no problem, please come. Uh, you'll understand what it means. And uh, of course, lots of uh, middle managers and uh, first-time managers. So we had all of them. Uh, we would form them uh, into. Uh, form them into, into pairs, you say, because we didn't want to leave somebody uh, completely alone. So we say, okay, here you, you and your partner. And then in Mumbai, we would ask them to empty their pockets. Now remember, this is all being done completely. Uh, the people don't know what's going on. They don't. They have not been told anything. So they come to the to the to the assembly place where they are going to assemble to go to uh, the actual site of the outdoor leadership course uh, so all their luggage and everything else is of course taken away and it's going to be shipped to them and then we say to them all right now empty your pockets and we give each of them a, a big uh, envelope uh, we say put everything in your pockets into that envelope and seal it put your name on it and everything means everything your wallet, including your wallet, including your credit cards, including all the money you have, right? everything, whatever. If you have a pen, you, that pen goes into that. Now, this was, this was in, the, uh, in the 80s, so there were no cell phones. Otherwise, we would have done that as well. Put your cell phone in that. Everything put into this packet and the packet is sealed. And then we say, now, find yourself. This is the route. This is the place, the address in Pune. Remember, no GPSs. We didn't have GPSs in those days. Um, here is the address in Pune. Get yourself to that place. <laughs> you, you know, it's um, it's absolutely. Uh, sometimes I laugh when I recollect the expressions on the faces of some of these people, because literally. Here is a is a is a, um, a senior executive in a large corporation, and I have been there. Uh, I was uh, a general manager in a very large plantation company, uh, and I knew, uh, so I know what it means to be a senior manager in a large corporation. You have a lot of resources. You have people to do everything you want. You have. Uh, at a at a personal level, you have servants, you have drivers, you have cars, and not one, multiple. And uh, at an official level, you've got a secretary uh, who's trained, who knows everything, literally she or he reads your mind uh, and does things before you can even imagine, uh, before you can even think of that, right? And so on and so forth. Plus, you have all sorts of contacts and whatnot. Now, for somebody like that, for everything to be taken from them, ex literally except the shirt on their back. And the task is get from Bombay to Pura. The shock on their faces. They would be shocked, some of them would be angry. And I would tell them, no problem. If you don't want to do this exercise, please let me know. I give back everything. I'm not going to change the exercise for anyone. And if you don't want to, we are not forcing you. If you don't want to be part of the exercise, please take everything and you can go away home and you are not part of this whole leadership course. But if you want to be part of the exercise, then you have to participate. You must participate. Of course, everyone, I mean, after they got, you know, they got over their initial shock and so on, then people would take a very positive view of that. They would have, they would say, oh, we are going to have fun. But believe me, after the exercise, and many of them, then what did they do? Well, you know, they, uh, they thumbed rides on, uh, on trucks, most of them they did that. They thumbed a ride on a truck, uh, going towards Pune. That's that's the highway. So they uh, took a ride on the truck going going to uh, Pune, and they got themselves there. And then we would do the debrief, and we would say, "What did it feel like?" And believe me, some of them. I mean, some of the language that I heard, I don't want to repeat that here. I mean, that's when some of the real anger came out. <laughs> a lot of that was directed at me initially because you are the cause of this until they realized what it is that I was teaching them. And then they would literally, there were people who would come and touch my feet and say, you are our guru. And you are the person who taught us, taught me the meaning of life. Seriously. We learn when we are deprived. 
So I have given you now three, four exercises to do, and I am going to end this class now. Uh, we, remember, remember what are we focusing on? How to be grateful to Allah, shukr. And I've given you three or four exercises to think about that and say, how can I be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I wish you all the best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you uh, the understanding and learning of this and we continue next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.